This is Daily Blast Live. We're talking about what you're talking about. Real, honest, entertaining, live. DBL starts right now. Welcome to Daily Blast Live. I'm Erica in for Sam. I'm here with Al and Brandon. And today we are paying tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his legacy of nonviolent protests in pursuit of civil rights. And joining us on this very special day is someone who is no stranger to justice. Please welcome Judge Mathis. Welcome back to DBL. Of mine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We are so excited for you to be here, especially today. Now, you command the courtroom on TV, but you are also this black culture motivational speaker with so much to share. So first, Judge, what does MLK Day mean to you and how do you honor Dr. King's legacy? Well, it means uh, fighting for equal rights and the continuation thereof. And I honor him by hosting a uh, King breakfast every year on behalf of Reverend Jackson's Rainbow Push, where I serve as chairperson. Um, I began my career working with Reverend Jackson and learned much of, uh, about politics and civil rights. Uh, and so I'm kind of uh, uh, privileged or uh, grateful to have uh, learned from someone who learned from Dr. King. And so it means a struggle for equal rights that continues until we are, uh, until we're able to experience equality. Mm. All right, Judge, uh, they have a question prepared for me on the prompter, but I'm going to go off prompter for a second because I just have to know this, and I want to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, you've done very well for yourself, uh, and congratulations. You've led an incredible life, but you're still here fighting when you could literally probably be in the south of France with a glass of red wine overlooking your villa. Why are you still here fighting with us? And thank you. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's interesting that you would say that because when people give me a little too much pressure about something, sometimes I tell them that. I say, hey, I work, I work 90 days a year, and I could be on the beach in Malibu <laughs> the other 280 days. So don't put too much pressure on me. But no, uh, <laughs> I'm motivated by uh, my life experience, which I think is the motivation for most people's uh, uh, actions. And that being someone who came up in a poor and crime and drug written community, uh, which was segregated. And after going to college, it kind of opened my eyes and I began to learn more. And that reinforced my commitment to fight uh, for equal justice and equal opportunity. And I met Reverend Jackson when he was uh, lecturing and asked if I could uh, join the movement with him. And he told me if I went to college and came back, I could. Well, four years later, he was organizing for president and I walked up to him in Detroit at a church. I said, I met you and four years ago, you told me if I come back, that I could work with you. So I've been working with Reverend Jackson and in Detroit politics for many years since I graduated college. And so this is part of uh, who I am, just a continuation. Wow, Judge, you, you mentioned fight, community, equality. So let's talk about the future. What can we do as a society to work on uh, and how can we move forward? Yeah, we have to take the blinders off and stop running away from it. Um, it, it is a reality that there is um, uh, disparities, major disparities in economics, in the criminal justice system, in education. And we have to talk about why that is. And quite frankly, much of it is the vestiges of both slavery and discrimination and segregation. But we don't want to accept that. Uh, we want to continue to talk about the equal opportunity that is available to everyone. Well, if you have a failed education system, you don't have the equal opportunity. And the fact is, uh, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that white wealth is 10 times that of black wealth? Why is it that there's a 30% gap in high school, college uh, 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 and college, a little more than that, graduation rate? and the criminal justice system, once again, the crime weight in the inner city. We'd have to conclude that black folks were born with some type of inferior gene 
unless we concluded that there's something that put us in this condition that we live in now. And certainly we not in, we don't have an inferior gene. Black men are not born to be criminals. We don't have crime in our veins. There's something about this society that has driven uh, black men to represent half of the prison population, yet only 6% of U.S. society. We have to be honest with each other. Well, I think that we've been more honest or been forced into honesty more forced than ever honesty, over the yeah, past. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. forced into honesty yeah. uh, over the past year because due to the pandemic and um, social justice issues taking forefront, so many of the disparities in terms of health care, in terms of yeah. housing, uh, pre-existing health conditions that have contributed to black and brown people being affected with COVID disproportionately than any other group in this country. So uh, when we're having these conversations, and especially I always would get the note, when you meet your mentor, you better walk away with some wisdom. So I am going to come for you, okay? <laughs> I want to know, how do we as black people on, on in front of a camera, how are we to meet the moment continuously when we are having conversations about stories when we are a part of the story? We're not reporting on something that is foreign to us. We're not reporting on something that our families aren't experiencing in the moment. So what advice do you have for us sitting here on this panel? Yes, you all are in a unique position to bring light and awareness to both the challenges that we still have and a way out. Uh, for example, uh, most of what I talked about its root cause now is in poverty. And the last uh, organizing effort from Dr. King, uh, aside from marching with the uh, uh, garbage workers there, the, uh, was in DC, they organized a poor people's campaign to eliminate poverty. So he began on what was our next track, eliminating poverty. When you're not living in an impoverished neighborhood, the crime rate is down. When you're living in a better neighborhood, the schools are better. So much of the root cause of what we experience is poverty. And we're seeing that, as you say, in the health care disparity that has led to so many deaths and devastation in the black community and the Latin community in contrast to other communities. Well, Judge, I want to ask you uh, this question because actually the last time I interviewed you, uh, it was just one-on-one. -on -one. I didn't have uh, my two co-hosts hogging my time with the judge. <laughs> All right, I'll get on y'all later. Uh, You'll get your time in court. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I, I was actually lucky enough to talk to you about the incredible philanthropic efforts that you took with uh, the Flint Water I, mm -hmm. crime. I don't want to call it a crisis. It was a crime, and this is where I'm going with this question. You as a judge, you should be able to answer this better than anybody. I feel as if unless we see some real punishments handed out, things like what happened in Flint will continue to happen. If I poison my wife, that would be a story on some kind of, you know, a HLN true Saturday true yeah. crime story. A city was poisoned. Where are, who, who's responsible? What's, where's the inv investigation? What do you think should happen with that on the criminal side, as opposed to all the funds that we're gonna need to, to help with the people that were poisoned over the course of years? Well, the good news is, and that's why I'm smiling, uh, we recently indicted yes. the, the Attorney General yes. of Michigan, the governor, and many of his aides and other public officials for their role. And I'm hoping that they will go beyond misdemeanors and it's uh, manslaughter, if you ask me, uh, and because you knew or should have known that what was happening would lead to the death of many people. And so uh, I'm grateful that the attorney general in Michigan decided that it was worthy of prosecution of the governor himself. And so I'll be back up there trying to push for heavy sentencing once they are either convicted, and hopefully that's the case, or they plead guilty. Uh, that's the next step. 
Judge Mathis, uh, we just want to thank you so yeah. much. We are we are always following you, whether it's for uh, words of inspiration and wisdom, or you know, because we just we just love you. Okay, <laughs> we love you, you, and we I always appreciate you, you spending time with us on DBL. So thank you so much for your time. We know you're a very thank busy you. man. Thanks, Judge. Thank you. Call Judge. on me whenever you need. Yes, thank well, you. We gonna hold you to it. Be careful what you wish for. All right. <laughs> right. Well, we're Go honoring. <laughs> Bye. We're honoring Black voices, including a group of black cowboys in Compton, California. They're combating stereotypes and getting a lot of attention in the process. And as we go to break, we want to leave you with these inspiring words of Dr. King. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntary, voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. We'll be right back. Welcome back to DBL. Black Cowboys, their stories aren't typically found in the history books, but they exist. And they in fact are thriving in a California town that isn't known for its ranches. Here's a look at the Compton Cowboys in this Encore DBL Spotlight. Gonna take my horse through the old town road. I'm gonna ride till I can't no more. I got the horses. A black cowboy riding his horse through the city. An idea brought mainstream by Lil Nas X and his Old Town Road video. But he was far from the first to do it. Meet the Compton Cowboys. They've been riding since the 1990s. A close-knit group of friends who started riding during childhood through a local riding program. Today, they saddle up and walk the streets with hopes of dousing the negative stereotypes about African Americans within their city. In a city that is best known for its use in rap songs and large amount of gang violence, the Compton Cowboys are hoping to bring change to their city with each ride. This is the original Compton. It's horses, it's, it's 
our people, you know what I'm saying? So we just out here representing for that original content and it's all about peace, love, unity, environment, nature, and each other. That's what it's all about. They give youth an alternative to gangs, providing a family bond and the pride that comes with physical labor. I put a lot of our time, effort, and energy into the horse. Give them a lot of the grooming and touching that, you know, sometimes we desire as well. We're able to give it to the horses. And it just puts me in a great space uh, mentally, spiritually, physically, uh, to be around these animals. Richland Farms is where the horses live when they aren't walking the streets. From cleaning the stables to feeding and grooming the animals, each rider does their fair share of daily chores at the farm. Man, for the youth in Compton, this is a huge deal. Uh, I had, you know, very few options on getting out of here, you know, like, and that was my main goal, you know, how I was going to get out. But the responsibilities of the Compton Cowboys are a heavy one. Black Lives Matter! Not only is this group hoping to change their city, but they're also trying to break the deeply embedded stereotype that African Americans can't be cowboys. My auntie Vision, you feel me? Yeah. My daddy Vision, you feel me? I feel like I'm making my family proud, you feel me? We making the whole hood proud, bro. We making the city proud. With some of them even becoming professional riders. Regardless of the task at hand, each rider embraces the challenge. Living by the motto, streets raised us, horses saved us. Stick around for more with the Compton Cowboys, including my conversation with a proud black cowboy. This was my homie. I'm so glad I got a chance to talk to Randy Savvy, whose message of inspiration is changing lives. That's right after the break. Welcome back to DBL. Earlier we showed you the story about a group of Compton Cowboys who ride horseback and make a positive impact on inner city youth. Now, let's take a look back at my interview with their leader, Randy Savvy, who says being a cowboy saved his life. Al Jackson, what's going on, brother? That hat, I need one. You know how it go, man. This, this is a uh, this is family legacy right here. This is my daddy hat. He gave it to me when I turned 25. Oh, that's what's up. Okay, well, I'm gonna. That's not even in our questions, but I need to get that answer on camera. That's beautiful. Randy Savvy, welcome to DBL. It's a pleasure to have you guys on. What is it like as a black man riding a horse through Compton? Being a black man on a horse through Compton, man, it's so it's so empowering, man. I mean, it's like 
I always imagine what a superhero might feel like because you ride through these streets and everybody just looking and breaking their neck when they look when they see you coming by and their faces light up, the kids point, you know what I mean? I feel you. Now, a lot of kids are going to be watching this, and I know they're going to want to know, when did you start? Did you start as a kid, and if so, what age? Yeah, man, I was actually born into it. My auntie founded the organization, Compton Junior Posse, so by the time I was born, she already had two horses and the rickety old little barn in the back. And uh, so I've been doing this my whole entire life. I'm 30 years old, so it's, you know, this, this life long for me. Well, that's my next question. What do you think your life would have been like without the Compton Cowboys? You know, if you're from the hood or you've been around the hood, you know it all too well. It's the same story, you know what I'm saying? You start growing up, you start getting on your own, and the, you know, the, the hood starts wanting to recruit you. They never really bothered us because we had the horses. It was like, oh man, y'all Cowboys, that's cool. Do y'all thing, we ain't tripping, you know what I mean? So it was like a shield for us, you know? And uh, just having that my whole life kept me away from all of that. You know, I consider myself a set symbol, you know what I mean, and, and representation of what it looks like to, to, to do something with your life. Uh, there's no doubt in the world that you are a success symbol, man. And, and I'm going to go off a word that you just mentioned. You mentioned shield, and I feel like you are there for uh, my people, for your people during these Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, I've been down to the protests, and I know the Compton Cowboys have been all over the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your involvement? In the city of Compton, it's interesting because our city is infamous for being very hostile when it comes to these uh, issues of uh, these social injustice issues, very particularly when it comes to police brutality. I mean, that was NWA's whole movement, and that movement is what put Compton on the global scale as far as being having our city recognized by the masses, and, and uh, the brand of our city became the police. What's up? Tell them where you're from. Straight out of Compton. It was just great to be able to be out there, black people on horses, showing the world something totally different, looking like the army, looking like the cavalry, but we come in peace. You know, that was great problem. I love to hear that, man. Now, obviously, you guys are getting attention in the streets. You're getting attention on social media. And now uh, an author has stepped to you guys and actually even embedded himself with you and just like learned to live your lifestyle and learned all about you. Can you tell me a little bit about that process and what that was like? It's just called The Comic Cowboys, a new generation of cowboys in America's urban heart learned by Walter Thompson Hernandez. It's very emotional, uh, it's very powerful, it's very moving. I think I would encourage anybody that, you know, to, to get, go, out to, go out there and get you a copy of it. I think he really got, he, he, he painted an accurate portrait of what it's like to be in, in this environment, in these streets, and it's very, I'm very proud of the project. Randy, let me just tell you this, bruh. Any project that you guys have going on, anything that you have coming up in the future that you would like to promote, you are now officially DBL fam, so you are now required by law to come on this show and definitely represent. We love you, we love what you're doing, and keep it going, bro. Thank you all, I appreciate you heavily, man. Much love, thank you. Randy, I stand by those words. I expect to see you in 2021, bro. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to DBL. Before we go, we've got some more of your comments about what you're doing this MLK Day. Of course, we always love to hear from you, DBL Nation. Betty writes, I usually volunteer for MLK Day, but this year I'm attending a virtual Dr. King holiday observance. I love it. Love mm -hmm. that too, Betty. Phil says, nothing, not even a pandemic will stop me from giving back again this year. I'm volunteering at my local food pantry. And Deb writes, since there is no parade this year, I'm sitting back and reading a book about his legacy. There are so many good ones to choose from. You know, <laughs> yes. earlier at the beginning of the show, you guys talked about that experience I had when, um, when I text you all um, when I was upset with the, what was going on with the George Floyd thing, I almost threw my, my life away. DBL Nation, please, like, it's, this this is this is why I love you guys so much and this is because that sense of community you know looking out for one another and DBL Nation like you you have kids you have family members that could have gone out and threw their lives away because they were frustrated they were infuriated but we need that that support system we need that community because that's when we come together and we take that frustration and we make it into action so again thank you all thank you uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and and thank you for that message and remember this, we live Brandon, that message every day no one has done as much with bricks that Stacey Abrams did yeah with yes. getting out and knocking on doors yeah. so that's that Tell you're talking yeah. about tell it and I do remember that conversation Al I was like you gonna get them or am I <laughs> uh, before we go we wanted we to leave em. you with these words from Dr. King the time is always right to do what is right hey man I love you dog love you guys <laughs>